the story told by Dionneo, evoked, at first, some qualms of shame in the minds of the ladies, as was apparent by the modest blush that tinged their faces; then exchanging glances, and scarce able to refrain their mirth, they listened to it with half suppressed smiles. On its conclusion they bestowed upon Dionneo a few words of gentle reprehension, with intent to admonish him that such stories were not to be told among ladies. The Queen then turned to Fiametta, who was seated on the grass at her side, and bade her follow suit; and Fiametta, with a gay and gracious mien, thus began: "The line upon which our story telling proceeds, to wit, to show the virtue that resides in apt and ready repartees, pleases me well; and as in affairs of love, men and women are in divers case, for to aspire to the love of a woman of higher lineage than his own is wisdom in man, whereas a woman's good sense is then most conspicuous when she knows how to preserve herself from becoming enamoured of a man, her superior in rank. I am minded, fair my ladies, to show you by the story which I am now to tell, how by deed and word a gentlewoman both defended herself against attack and weaned her suitor from his love. The Marquis of Monferrato, a paladin of distinguished prowess, was gone overseas as Gonfalonier of the Church in a general array of the Christian forces, whose merits being canvassed as the court of Philippe de Borgne, in the eve of his departure from France on the same service, a knight observed that there was not under the stars a couple comparable to the Marquis and his lady, in that while the Marquis was a paragon of the knightly virtues, his lady for beauty and honour was without a peer among all the other ladies of the world. These words made so deep an impression on the mind of the King of France, that, though he had never seen the lady, he fell ardently in love with her, and being to join the Armada, resolved that his port of embarkation should be no other than Genoa, in order that, travelling thither by land, he might find a decent pretext for visiting the Marchioness, with whom, in the absence of the Marquis, he trusted to have the success which he desired. Nor did he fail to put his design in execution. Having sent his many army on before, he took the road himself with a small company of gentlemen, and as they approached the territory of the Marquis, he dispatched a courier to the Marchioness a day in advance, to let her know that he expected to breakfast with her the next morning. The lady, who knew her part and played it well, replied graciously that he would be indeed welcome, and that his presence would be the greatest of all favours. She then began to commune with herself what this might import, that so great a king should come to visit her in her husband's absence, nor was she so deluded as not to surmise that it was the fame of her beauty that drew him thither. Nevertheless, she made ready to do him honour in a manner befitting her high degree, summoning to her presence such of the retainers as remained in the castle, and giving all needful directions with their advice, except that the order of the banquet and the choice of the dishes she reserved entirely to herself. Then, having caused all the hens that could be found in the countryside to be brought with all speed into the castle, she bade her cooks furnish forth the royal table with diverse dishes made exclusively of such fare. The king arrived on the appointed day, and was received by the lady with great and ceremonious cheer. Fair and noble and gracious seemed she in the eyes of the king, beyond all that he had conceived from the knight's words, so that he was lost in admiration, and inly extolled her to the skies his passion being the more inflamed in proportion as he found the lady surpassed the idea which he had formed of her. A suite of rooms furnished with all the appointments befitting the reception of so great a king was placed at his disposal, and after a little rest, breakfast time being come, he and the marchioness took their places at the same table, while his suite were honourably entertained at other boards according to their several qualities. Many courses were served with no lack of excellent and rare wines, whereby the king was mightily pleased, as also by the extraordinary beauty of the marchioness, on whom his eye from time to time rested. 
However, as course followed course, the King observed with some surprise that, though the dishes were diverse, yet they were all but variations of one and the same fare, to wit, the pullet. Besides which he knew that the domain was one which could not but afford plenty of diverse sorts of game, and by forewarning the lady of his approach, he had allowed time for hunting. Yet, for all his surprise, he would not broach the question more directly with her than by a reference to her hens. So, turning to her with a smile, he said, Madam, do hens grow in this country without so much as a single cock? The marchioness, who perfectly apprehended the drift of the question, saw in it an opportunity, sent her by God, of evincing her virtuous resolution. So, casting a haughty glance upon the king, she answered thus, Sire, no, but the women, though they may differ somewhat from others in dress and rank, are yet of the same nature here as elsewhere. The significance of the banquet of pullets was made manifest to the king by these words, as also the virtue which they veiled. He perceived that on a lady of such a temper words would be wasted, and that force was out of the question. Wherefore, yielding to the dictates of prudence and honour, he was now as prompt to quench, as he had been inconsiderate in conceiving, his unfortunate passion for the lady, and fearing her answers, he refrained from further jesting with her, and, dismissing his hopes, devoted himself to his breakfast, which done, he disarmed suspicion of the dishonourable purpose of his visit by an early departure, and thanking her for the honour she had conferred upon him, and commending her to God, took the road to Genoa. End of day one. The fifth story. Day one. The sixth story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day one, the sixth story. A worthy man by an apt saying puts to shame the wicked hypocrisy of the religious. When all had commended the virtue of the marchioness and the spirited reproof which she administered to the king of France, Emilia, who sate next to Fiametta, obeyed the queen's behest and with a good courage thus begun. My story is also of a reproof, but of one administered by a worthy man who lived the secular life to a greedy religious by a jibe as merry as admirable. Know then, dear ladies, that there was in our city not long ago a friar minor, an inquisitor in matters of heresy, who, albeit he strove might and main to pass himself off as a holy man and tenderly solicitous for the integrity of the Christian faith, as they all do, yet he had as keen a scent for a full purse as for a deficiency of faith. Now it so chanced that his zeal was rewarded by the discovery of a good man far better furnished with money than with sense, who in an unguarded moment, not from defect of faith, but rather, perhaps, from excess of hilarity, being heated with wine, had happened to say to his boon companions that he had a wine good enough for Christ himself to drink. Which, being reported to the Inquisitor, he, knowing the man to be possessed of large estates and a well-lined purse, set to work in hot haste, cum gladius et fustibus, to bring all the rigour of the law to bear upon him, designing thereby not to lighten the load of his victim's misbelief, but to increase the weight of his own purse by the florins which he might, as he did, receive from him. So he cited him to his presence, and asked him whether what was alleged against him were true. The good man answered in the affirmative, and told him how it had happened. Then, said our most holy and devout inquisitor of St. John Goldenbeard, then hast thou made Christ a wine-bibber, and a lover of rare vintages, as if he were a sot, a toper, and a tavern-hunter, even as one of you, and thinks thou now by a few words of apology to pass this off as a light matter. It is no such thing as thou supposest. Thou hast deserved the fire, and we should but do our duty that we inflict it upon thee. With these and the like words in plenty he upbraided him, bending on him meanwhile a countenance as stern as if Epicurus had stood before him, denying the immortality of the soul. 
In short, he so terrified him that the good man was fain to employ certain intermediaries to anoint his palms with a liberal allowance of St. John Goldenmouth's grease, an excellent remedy for the disease of avarice, which spreads like a pestilence among the clergy, and notably among the friar's minors, who dare not touch a coin, that he might deal gently with him. And great being the virtue of this ointment, albeit no mention is made thereof by Galen in any part of his medicines, it had so gracious an effect that the threatened fire gave place to a cross, which he was to wear as if he were bound for the emprise overseas, and to make the ensign more handsome, the inquisitor ordered that it should be yellow upon a black ground. Besides which, after pocketing the coin, he kept him dangling about him for some days, bidding him by way of penance hear mass every morning at Santa Croce, and afterwards wait upon him at the breakfast hour, after which he was free to do as he pleased for the rest of the day. All which he most carefully observed, and so it fell out that one of these mornings there were chanted at the mass at which he assisted the following words of the gospel, You shall receive a hundredfold, and shall possess eternal life. With these words deeply graven in his memory, he presented himself, as he was bidden, before the inquisitor, where he sat, taking his breakfast, and being asked whether he had heard mass that morning, he promptly answered, Yes, sir. And being further asked, Hearest thou aught therein, as to which thou art in doubt, or hast thou any question to propound? The good man responded, Nay, indeed, doubt have I none of aught that I heard, but rather assured faith in the verity of all. One thing, however, I heard, which caused me to commiserate you and the rest of you, friars, very heartily, in regard of the evil plight in which you must find yourselves in the other world. And what, said the inquisitor, was the passage that so moved thee to commiserate us? Sir, rejoined the good man, it was that passage in the gospel which says, You shall receive a hundredfold. You heard aright, said the inquisitor, but why did the passage so affect you? Sir, replied the good man, I will tell you. Since I have been in attendance here, I have seen a crowd of poor folk receive a daily dole, now of one, now of two, huge terrines of swill, being the refuse from your table and that of the brothers of this convent. Whereof, if you are to receive a hundredfold in the other world, you'll have so much that it will go hard, but you are all drowned therein. This raised a general laugh among those who sat at the inquisitor's table, whereat the inquisitor, feeling that their gluttony and hypocrisy had received a home thrust, was very wroth, and, but that what he had already done had not escaped censure, would have instituted fresh proceedings against him in revenge for the pleasantry with which he had rebuked the baseness of himself and his brother friars. So, in impotent wrath, he bade him go about his business and show himself there no more. End of Day One, The Sixth Story Day One, the Seventh Story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day One, the Seventh Story. Bergamino, with the story of Primaso and the Abbot of Cluny, finally censures a sudden access of avarice in Monsieur Cane de la Scala. Emilia's charming manner and her story drew laughter and commendation from the queen and all the company, who were much tickled by her new type of crusader. When the laughter had subsided, and all were again silent, Philostrato, on whom the narration now fell, began on this wise. A fine thing it is, noble ladies, to hit a fixed mark. But if, on the sudden appearance of some strange object, it be forthwith hit by the bowmen, tis little short of a miracle. The corrupt and filthy life of the clergy offers, on many sides, a fixed mark of iniquity, at which, whoever is so minded, may let fly, with little doubt that they will reach it, the winged words of reproof and reprehension. Wherefore, Though the worthy man did well to censure in the person of the inquisitor the pretended charity of the friars who give to the poor what they ought rather to give to the pigs or throw away. Higher indeed is the praise which I accord of him of whom, 
taking my cue from the last story, I made to speak, seeing that by a clever apologue he rebuked a sudden and unwonted access of avarice in Messer Cane della Scala, conveying in a figure what he had at heart to say touching Messer Cane and himself, which apologue is to follow: Far and wide, almost to the ends of the earth, is borne the most illustrious renown of Messer Cane della Scala, in many ways the favoured child of fortune, a lord almost without a peer among the notables and magnificoes of Italy since the time of the Emperor Frederick the Second. Now Messer Cane, being minded to hold high festival at Verona, whereof fame should speak marvellous things and many folk from divers parts, of which the greater number were jesters of every order, being already arrived. Messer Cane did suddenly, for some cause or another, abandon his design, and dismissed them with a partial recompense. One only, Bergamino by name, a speaker ready and polished in a degree credible only to such as heard him, remained, having received no recompense or conge, still cherishing the hopes that this omission might yet turn out to his advantage. But Messer Cane was possessed with the idea that whatever he might give Bergamino would be far more completely thrown away than if he had tossed it into the fire. So never a word of the sort said he, or sent he to him. A few days thus passed, and then Bergamino, seeing that he was in no demand or request for aught that belonged to his office, and being also at heavy charges at his inn for the keep of his horses and servants, fell into a sort of melancholy. But he still waited a while, not deeming it expedient to leave. He had brought with him three rich and goodly robes, given him by other lords, that he might make a brave show at the festival, and when his host began to press for payment, he gave him one of the robes. Afterwards, there being still much outstanding against him, he must needs, if he would tarry longer at the inn, give the host the second robe. After which he began to live on the third, being minded to remain there, as long as it would hold out, in expectation of better luck, and then to take his departure. Now, while he was thus living on the third robe, it chanced that Messer Cane encountered him one day, as he sate at breakfast, with a very melancholy visage, which Messer Cane, observing, said, rather to tease him than expecting to solicit from him any pleasant retort, What ails thee, Bergamino, that thou art so melancholy? Let me know the reason why. Whereupon Bergamino, without a moment's reflection, told the following story, which could not have fitted his own case more exactly, if it had been long premeditated. My lord, you must know that Primasso was a grammarian of great eminence, and excellent and quick beyond all others in versifying, whereby he waxed so notable and famous that, albeit he was not everywhere known by sight, yet there were scarce any that did not at least know by name and report who Primasso was. Now it so happened that, being once at Paris in straitened circumstances, as was his lot to be most of his time by reason that virtue is little appreciated by the powerful, he heard speak of the abbot of Cluny, who, except the Pope, is supposed to be the richest prelate. In regard to his vast revenues, that the Church of God can show, and marvelous and magnificent things were told him of the perpetual court which the abbot kept, and how, wherever he was, he denied not to any that came there either meat or drink, so only that he preferred his request while the abbot was at table. Which, when Primasso heard, he determined to go and see for himself what magnificent state this abbot kept, for he was one that took great delight in observing the ways of powerful and lordly men. Wherefore he asked how far from Paris was the abbot then sojourning. He was informed that the abbot was then at one of his places distance, perhaps six miles, which Primasso concluded he could reach in time for breakfast, if he started early in the morning. When he had learned the way, he found that no one else was traveling by it, and fearing, lest by mischance he should lose it, and so find himself where it would not be easy for him to get food, he determined to obviate so disagreeable a contingency by taking with him three loaves of bread. As for drink, water, though not much to his taste, was, he supposed, to be found everywhere. So, having disposed the loaves in the fold of his tunic, he took the road, and made such progress that he reached the abbot's place of sojourn before the breakfast hour. 
Having entered, he made the circuit of the entire place, observing everything, the vast array of tables, and the vast kitchen, well appointed with all things needful for the preparation and service of the breakfast, and saying to himself, "In very truth, this man is even such a magnifico as he was reported to be." While his attention was thus occupied, the abbot's seneschal, it now being breakfast time, gave order to serve water for the hands, which being washed, they sat them all down to breakfast. Now it so happened that Primaso was placed immediately in front of the door by which the abbot must pass from his chamber into the hall, in which, according to rule of his court, neither wine, nor bread, nor aught else drinkable or eatable was ever set on the tables before he made his appearance and was seated. The seneschal, therefore, having set the tables, sent word to the abbot that all was now ready, and they waited only his pleasure. So the abbot gave the word, the door of his chamber was thrown open, and he took a step or two forward, towards the hall, gazing straight in front of him as he went. Thus it fell out that the first man on whom he set eyes was Primaso, who was in very sorry trim. The abbot, who knew him not by sight, no sooner saw him, than, surprised by a churlish mood to which he had hitherto been an entire stranger, he said to himself, "So it is to such as this man that I give my hospitality." And going back into the chamber, he bade lock the door, and asked of his attendants whether the vile fellow that sat at table directly opposite the door was known to any of them, who one and all answered in the negative. Primaso waited a little, but he was not used to fast, and his journey had whetted his appetite. So, as the abbot did not return, he drew out one of the loaves which he had brought with him and began to eat. The abbot, after a while, bade one of his servants to go see whether Primaso were gone. The servant returned with the answer, "No, sir, and what is more, he is eating a loaf of bread which he seems to have brought with him." "Be it so then," said the abbot, who was vexed that he had not gone of his own accord, but was not disposed to turn him out. "Let him eat his own bread, if he have any." for he shall have none of ours today. By and by, Primaso, having finished his first loaf, began, as the abbot did not make his appearance, to eat the second, which was likewise reported to the abbot, who had again sent to see if he were gone. Finally, as the abbot still delayed his coming, Primaso, having finished the second loaf, began upon the third, whereof, once more, word was carried to the abbot, who now began to commune with himself, and said, Alas, my soul! What unwanted mood harborest thou today? What avarice, what scorn, and of whom? I have given my hospitality now for many a year to whoso craved it, without looking to see whether he were gentle or churl, poor or rich, merchant or cheat, and mine eyes have seen it squandered on vile fellows without number, and naught of that which I feel towards this man ever entered my mind. Assuredly it cannot be he is a man of no consequence who is the occasion of this access of avarice in me. Though he seemed to me a vile fellow, he must be some great man, that my mind is thus obstinately adverse to do him honor. Of which musings the upshot was that he sent to inquire who the vile fellow was, and, learning that he was Primaso, come to see if what he had heard of his magnificent state were true, he was stricken with shame, having heard of old Primaso's fame, and knowing him to be a great man. Wherefore, being zealous to make him the amen, he studied to do him honor in many ways, and after breakfast, that his guard might accord with his native dignity, he caused him to be nobly arrayed, and, setting him upon a palfrey and filling his purse, left it to his own choice whether to go or stay. So Primaso, with a full heart, thanked him for his courtesy, in terms the amplest that he could command, and, having left Paris afoot, returned thither on horseback. Mr. Cani was shrewd enough to apprehend Bergamino's meaning, perfectly well, without a gloss, and said with a smile, Bergamino, thy parable is apt, and declares to me very plainly thy losses, my avarice, and what thou desirest of me, and in good sooth this excess of avarice, of which thou art the occasion, is the first I have experienced, but I will expel the intruder with the baton, which thou thyself hath furnished. So he paid Bergamino's reckoning, habited him nobly in one of his own robes, gave him money and a palfrey, and left it for the time at his discretion whether to go or to stay. End of Day One, The Seventh Story
Day one, the eighth story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by G. M. Rigg. Day one, the eighth story. Guglielmo Borsiere, by a neat retort, sharply censures avarice in Messer Ermino de Grimaldi. Next Philostrato was seated Lauretta, who, when the praises bestowed on Bergamino's address had ceased, knowing that it was now her turn to speak, waited not for the word of command, but with a charming graciousness thus began. The last novel, dear gossips, prompt me to relate how a worthy man, likewise a jester, reprehended not without success the greed of a very wealthy merchant. And though the burden of my story is not unlike the last, yet perchance it may not on that account be the less appreciated by you, because it has a happy termination. Know then, that in Genoa there dwelt long ago a gentleman who was known as Messer Ermino de Grimaldi, and whose wealth both in lands and money, was generally supposed to be far in excess of that of any other burgher then in Italy. And as in wealth he was without a rival in Italy, so in meanness and avarice there was not any in the entire world, however richly endowed with those qualities, whom he did not immeasurably surpass, insomuch as that not only did he keep a tight grip upon his purse when honour was to be done to another, but in his personal expenditure, even upon things meet and proper, contrary to the general custom of the Genoese, whose wont is to array themselves nobly, he was extremely penurious, as also in his outlay upon his table. Wherefore, not without just cause, folk had dropped his surname de Grimaldi, and called him instead Messer Ermino Avarizia. While thus by thrift his wealth waxed greater and greater, it so chanced that there came to Genoa a jester of good parts, a man debonair and ready of speech, his name Guglielmo Borsiere, whose like is not to be found today, when jesters, to great reproach be it spoken of those that claim the name and reputation of gentlemen, are rather to be called asses, being without courtly breeding, and formed after the coarse pattern of the basest of churls. And whereas in the days of which I speak they made it their business, they spared no pains to compose quarrels, to allay heart-burnings between gentlemen, or arrange marriages, or leagues of amity, ministering meanwhile relief to jaded minds and solace to courts by the sprightly sallies of their wit, and with keen sarcasm like fathers, censuring churlish manners, being also satisfied with very trifling guerdons, Nowadays, all their care is to spend their time in scandal-mongering, in sowing discord, in saying, and what is worse, in doing, in the presence of company, things churlish and flagitious, in bringing accusations, true or false, of wicked, shameful, or flagitious conduct against one another, and in drawing gentlemen into base and nefarious practices by sinister and insidious arts. And by these wretched and depraved lords, he is held most dear and best rewarded, whose words and deeds are the most atrocious, to the great reproach and scandal of the world of today, whereby it is abundantly manifest that virtue has departed from the earth, leaving a degenerate generation to wallow in the lowest depths of vice. But, reverting to the point at which I started, wherefrom, under stress of just indignation, I have deviated somewhat further than I intended, I say that the said Guglielmo was had in honour, and was well received by all the gentlemen of Genoa, and tarrying some days in the city, heard much of the meanness and avarice of Messer Ermino, and was curious to see him. Now Messer Ermino had heard that this Guglielmo Bossiere was a man of good parts, and notwithstanding his avarice, having in him some sparks of good breeding, received him with words of hearty greeting and a gladsome mien, and conversed freely with him and of diverse matters, and so conversing, took him with other Genoese that were of his company, to a new and very beautiful house which he had built. And after showing him over the whole of it, said to him, Now, Messer Guglielmo, you have seen and heard many things, could you suggest to me something the like of which has not hitherto been seen, 
which I might have painted here in the saloon of this house. To which ill-judged question Guglielmo replied, "Sir, it would not, I think, be in my power to suggest anything the like of which has never been seen, unless it were a sneeze or something similar; but if it so please you, I have something to suggest which I think you have never seen." "Prithee, what may that be?" said Messer Emino, not expecting to get the answer which he got; for Guglielmo replied forthwith, "Paint courtesy here." Which Messer Emino had no sooner heard than he was so stricken with shame that his disposition underwent a complete change, and he said, "Messer Guglielmo, I will see to it that courtesy is here painted in such wise that neither you nor any one else shall ever again have reason to tell me that I have not seen or known that virtue." And henceforward, so enduring was the change wrought by Guglielmo's words. There was not in Genoa, while he lived, any gentleman so liberal and so gracious, and so lavish of honour both to strangers and to fellow citizens, as Messer Ermino de Grimaldi. End of day one, the eighth story. Day one, the ninth story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by J. M. Rick, Day One, the Ninth Story. The censure of a Gascon lady converts the king of Cyprus from a churlish to an honorable temper. Except Elisa, none now remained to answer the call of the queen, and she, without waiting for it, with gladsome alacrity, thus begun. Bethink you, damsels, how often it has happened that men, who have been obdurate to censures and chastisements, have been reclaimed by some unpremeditated casual word. This is plainly manifest by the story told by Lauretta, and by mine, which will be of the briefest. I mean further to illustrate it. Seeing that, good stories, being always pleasurable, are worth listening to with attention, no matter by whom they may be told. To us, then, in the time of the first king of Cyprus, after the conquest made of the Holy Land by Godfrey the Bouillon, that a lady of Gascony made a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, and on her way home, having landed at Cyprus, met with brutal outrage at the hands of certain ruffians. Broken-hearted and disconsolate, she determined to make her complaint to the king. But she was told that it would be all in vain, because so spiritless and fainéant was he, that he not only neglected to avenge affronts put upon others, but endured with a reprehensible tameness those that were offered to himself, insomuch that whoso had any ill humor to vent, took occasion to vex or mortify him. The lady, hearing this report, despaired of redress, and by way of alleviation of her grief, determined to make the king sensible of his baseness. So, in tears, she presented herself before him and said, Sire, it is not to seek redress of the wrong done me that I come before you, but only that, so please you, I may learn of you how it is that you suffer patiently the wrongs which, as I understand, are done you, that, thus schooled by you in patience, I may endure my own, which, God knows, I would gladly, were it possible, transfer to you, seeing that you are so well fitted to bear them. These words aroused the hitherto sluggish and apathetic king, as if it were from sleep. He redressed the lady's wrong, and having thus made a beginning, thenceforth meted out the most rigorous justice to all that in any wise offended against the majesty of his crown. End of Day One, 
the ninth story. Day one, the tenth story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miet. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day one, the tenth story. Master Alberto da Bologna honourably puts to shame a lady who sought occasion to put him to shame, and that he was in love with her. After Elisa had done, it only remained for the queen to conclude the day's storytelling, and thus, with manner de bonheur, did she begin. As stars in the serene expanse of heaven, as in springtime flowers in the green pastures, so, honourable damsels, in the hour of rare and excellent converse is wit with its bright sallies, which, being brief, are much more proper for ladies than for men, seeing that prolixity of speech, when brevity is possible, is much less allowable to them. Albeit, shame be to us all and all our generation, few ladies, or none, are left today who understand aught that is wittily said, or, understanding, are able to answer it. For the place of those graces of the spirit which distinguished the ladies of the past has now been usurped by adornments of the person, and she whose dress is most richly and variously and curiously dyed, accounts herself more worthy to be had in honour, forgetting that, were one but so to array, an ass would carry a far greater load of finery than any of them, for all that be not a whit the more deserving of honour. I blush to say this, for in censuring others I condemn myself. Tricked out, bedecked, bedizened thus, we are either silent and impassive as statues, or, if we answer aught that is said to us, much better were it we had held our peace. And we make believe, forsooth, that our failure to acquit ourselves and converse with our equals of either sex does but proceed from guilelessness, dignifying stupidity by the name of modesty, as if no lady could be modest and converse with other folk than her maid or laundress or bakehouse woman, which if nature had intended, as we fain she did, she would have set other limits to our garrulousness. True it is that in this, as in other matters, time and place and person are to be regarded, because it sometimes happens that a lady or gentleman thinking by some sally of wit to put another to shame has rather been put to shame by that other, having failed duly to estimate their relative powers. Wherefore, that you may be on your guard against such error, and further, that in you not be exemplified the common proverb to wit, that women do ever and on all occasions choose the worst, I trust that this last of today's stories, which falls to me to tell, may serve you as a lesson that, as you are distinguished from others by nobility of nature, so you may also shew yourselves separate from them by excellence of manners. There lived, not many years ago, perhaps yet lives, in Bologna, 
a very great physician. So great that the fame of his skill was noised abroad throughout almost the entire world. Now, Master Alberto, such was his name, was of so noble a temper that, being now nigh upon seventy years of age, and all but devoid of natural heat of body, he was yet receptive of the flames of love. And having at an assembly seen a very beautiful widow lady, Madonna Margarita de Chisolieri, as some say, and being charmed with her beyond measure, was, notwithstanding his age, no less ardently enamoured than a young man, insomuch that he was not well able to sleep at night, unless, during the day, he had seen the fair lady's lovely and delicate features. Wherefore he began to frequent the vicinity of her house, passing to and fro in front of it, now on foot, now on horseback, as occasion best served. Which she and many other ladies perceiving, made merry together more than once to see a man of his years and discretion and love, as if they deemed that this most delightful passion of love were only fit for empty-headed youths, and could not in men be either harboured or engendered. Master Alberto thus continuing to haunt the front of the house, it so happened that one feast day the lady with other ladies was seated before her door, and Master Alberto's approach being thus observed by them for some time before he arrived, they complotted to receive him and shew him honour, and then to rally him on his love. And so they did rising with one accord to receive him, bidding him welcome, and ushering him into a cool courtyard, where they regaled him with the finest wines and comfits, which done, in a tone of refined and sprightly banter, they asked him how it was that it came about that he was enamoured of this fair lady, seeing that she was beloved of many a fine gentleman of youth and spirit. Master Alberto, being thus courteously assailed, put a blithe face on it, and answered, Madam, my love for you need surprise none that is conversant with such matters, and least of all you that are worthy of it. And though old men, of course, have lost the strength which love demands for its full fruition, yet are they not therefore without the good intent and just appreciation of what beseems the accepted lover, but indeed understand it far better than young men, by reason that they have more experience? My hope in thus old aspiring to love you, who are loved by so many young men, is founded on what I have frequently observed of ladies' ways at lunch when they trifle with the lupin and the leek. In the leek, no part is good, but the head is at any rate not so bad as the rest, and indeed not unpalatable. You, however, for the most part, following a depraved taste, hold it in your hand and munch the leaves, which are not only of no account, but actually distasteful. How am I to know, madam, that in your selection of lovers you are not equally eccentric? in which case I should be the man of your choice, and the rest will be cast aside. Whereto the gentle lady, somewhat shame-stricken, as were also her fair friends, thus made answer. Master Alberto, our presumption has received from you a most just and no less courteous reproof, but your love is dear to me as should ever be that of a wise and worthy man. And therefore, saving my honour, I am yours, entirely and devotedly at your pleasure and command. This speech brought Master Alberto to his feet, 
and the others also rising, he thanked the lady for her courtesy, bade her a gay and smiling adieu, and so left the house. Thus the lady, not considering on whom she exercised her wit, thinking to conquer was conquered herself, against which mishap you, if you are discreet, will ever be most strictly on your guard. End of day one, the tenth story. A recording by Miet at Miet's Bedtime Story Podcast. Day one, the conclusion of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by A. M. Rigg. Translated by M. Rigg. Day one, the conclusion. As the young ladies and the three young men finished their storytelling, the sun was westering and the heat of the day in great measure abated, which their queen observing, debonnerly thus she spoke, Now, dear gossips, may a day of sovereignty draws to a close, and naught remains for me to do but to give you a new queen, by whom on the morrow our common life may be ordered as she may deem best, in a course of seemly pleasure, and though there seems to be still more interval between day and night, yet, as whoso does not in some degree anticipate the course of time, cannot well provide for the future, and in order that what the new queen shall decide to be meet for the morrow may be made ready beforehand, I decree that from this time forth the days begin at this hour. And so, in reverent submission to him in whom is the life of all beings, for our comfort and solace we commit the governance of our realm for the morrow in the hands of Queen Philomena, most discreet of damsels. So saying she arose, took the laurel wreath from her brow, and with a gesture of reverence set it on the brow of Philomena, whom she then, and after her all the other ladies and the young men, saluted as queen, doing her due and graceful homage. Queen Philomena modestly blushed a little to find herself thus invested with the sovereignty, but, being put on her mettle by Pampinea's recent admonitions, she was minded not to seem awkward, and soon recovered her composure. She then began by confirming all the appointments made by Pampinea, and making all needful arrangements for the following morning and evening, which they were to pass where they then were, Whereupon she thus spoke. Dearest gossips, though, thanks rather to Pompinea's courtesies and to merit of mine, I am made queen of you all, yet I am not on that account minded to have respect merely to my own judgment in the governance of our life, but to unite your wisdom with mine, and that you may understand what I think of doing, and by consequence may be able to amplify or curtail it at your pleasure. I will in few words make known to you my purpose. The course observed by Pompinea today, if I have judged aright, seems to be alike commendable and delectable. Wherefore, until by lapse of time, or for some other cause, it grew tedious, I purpose not to alter it. So when we have arranged for what we have already taken in hand, we will go hence and enjoy a short walk. At sundown we will stop in the cool and we will then sing a few songs, and otherwise divert ourselves, until it is time to go to sleep. Tomorrow we will rise in the cool of the morning, and after enjoying another walk, each at his or her sweet will, we will return as today, and in due time break our fast, dance, sleep, and having risen, will her resume our story-telling, wherein missings pleasure and profit unite in superabundant measure. True it is that Pampinea, by reason of her late election to the sovereignty, neglected one matter, which I mean to introduce, 
to wit, the circumscription of the topic of our story telling, and its preassignment, that each may be able to premeditate some apt story bearing upon the theme; and seeing that from the beginning of the world fortune has made men the sport of divers accidents, and so it will continue until the end, the theme, so please you, shall in each case be the same, to wit, the fortune of such as after divers adventures have at last attained a goal of unexpected felicity." The ladies and the young man alike commended the rule thus laid down, and agreed to follow it. Bruneo, however, when the rest had done speaking, said, "Madam, as all the rest have said, so say I, briefly, that the rule prescribed by you is commendable and delectable; but of your especial grace I crave a favour, which, I trust, may be granted and continued to me, so long as our company shall endure, which favour is this, that I be not bound by the assigned theme, if I am not so minded, but that I have leave to choose such topic as best shall please me, and lest any suppose that I crave this grace as one that has not stories ready to hand, I am henceforth content that mine be always the last." The queen, knowing him to be a merry and facetious fellow, and feeling sure that he only craved this favour in order that, if the company were jaded, he might have an opportunity to recreate them by some amusing story, gladly, with the consent of the rest, granted his petition. She then rose, and attended by the rest, sauntered towards the stream, which, issuing clear as crystal from a neighboring hill, precipitated itself into a valley, shaded by trees close set amid living rock and fresh green herbage. Bare of foot and arm, they entered the stream, and rowing hither and thither amused themselves in diverse ways, till in due time they returned to the palace and gaily supped. Supper ended, the queen sent for instruments of music, and bade Lauretta lead a dance, while Emilia was to sing a song, accompanied by Dioneo on the lute. Accordingly, Lauretta led a dance, while Emilia with passion sang the following song. So fain I am of my own loveliness, I hope nor think not e'er the way to feel of other amorousness. When in the mirror I my face behold, that see I there which doth my mind content, nor any present hap or memory old may me deprive of such sweet ravishment. Where else then should I find such blandishment of sight and sense that e'er my heart should know another amorousness? Nor need I fear lest the fair thing retreat when fain I am my solace to renew. Rather, I know, twill me advance to meet, to pleasure me, and show so sweet a view, that speech or thought of none its semblance true paint or conceive may ever, unless he burn with even such amorousness. Thereon, as more intent I gaze, the fire waxes within me hourly more and more. Myself I yield thereto, myself entire, and foretaste have of what it hath in store, and hope of greater joyance than before. Nay, such as ne'er none knew, for ne'er was felt such amorousness. This ballad, to which all heartily responded, albeit its words furnished much matter of thought to some, was followed by some other dances, and part of the brief night, being thus spent, the queen proclaimed the first day ended, and bade light the torches, that all might go to rest until the following morning. And so, seeking their several chambers, the rest they went. End of day one conclusion. Day second. Introduction of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by H. M. Rick. Day the Second. Introduction. Endeth here the first day of the Decameron, beginneth the second, in which, under the rule of Philomena, they discourse of the fortunes of such as, after diverse misadventures, have at last attained a goal 
of unexpected felicity. The sun was already trailing the new day in his wake of light, and the birds, blithely chanting their lays among the green boughs, carried the tidings to the ear, when with one accord all the ladies and the three young men arose, and entered the gardens, where for no little time they found their delight in sauntering about the dewy meads, straying hither and thither, culling flowers, and weaving them into fair garlands. The day passed like its predecessor; they breakfasted in the shade, and danced and slept until noon, when they rose, and, at their queen's behest, assembled in the cool meadow, and sat them down in a circle about her. Fair and very debonair she shewed, crowned with her laurel wreath, as for a brief space she scanned the company, and then bade Neifile shew others the way with a story. Neifile made no excuse, and gaily thus begun. End of day two, introduction. Day two, the first story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by J. M. Rigg. Day two, the first story. Martellino pretends to be a paralytic and makes it appear as if he were cured by being placed upon the body of St. Arrigo. His trick is detected, he is beaten and arrested, and is in peril of hanging, but finally escapes. Often has it happened, dearest ladies, that one who has studied to raise a laugh at others' expense, especially in regard of things worthy to be had in reverence, has found the laugh turn against himself, and sometimes to his loss. As, in obedience to the Queen's command, and by way of introducing our theme, I am about to show you, by the narrative of an adventure which befell one of our own citizens, and after a course of evil fortune, had an entirely unexpected and very felicitous issue. Not long ago there was at Treviso a German named Arrigo, a poor man, who got his living as a common hired porter, but, though of so humble a condition, was respected by all, being accounted not only an honest, but a most holy man, insomuch that, whether truly or falsely I know not, the Trevisans affirm that on his decease all the bells of the Cathedral of Trefiso began to toll of their own accord. Which being accounted a miracle, this Arrigo was generally reputed a saint, and all the people of the city gathered before the house where his body lay, and bore it with a saint's honours into the cathedral, and brought thither the halt and paralytic and blind, and others afflicted with disease or bodily defects, as hoping that by contact with this holy body they would all be healed. The people thus tumultuously thronging the church it so chanced that there arrived in Treviso three of our own citizens, of whom one was named Stecchi, another Martellino, and the third Marchese, all three being men whose habit it was to frequent the courts of the nobles and afford spectators amusement by assuming disguises and personating other men. Being entire strangers to the place and seeing everybody running to and fro, they were much astonished, and having learned the why and wherefore, were curious to go see what was to be seen. So at the inn where they put up, Marchese began, We would fain go see this saint, but for my part I know not how we are to reach the spot, for I hear the piazza is full of Germans and other armed men, posted there by the lord who rules here, to prevent an uproar, and moreover the church so far as one may learn, is so full of folk that scarce another soul may enter it. Whereupon Martellino, who was bent on seeing what was to be seen, said, Let not this deter us. I will assuredly find a way of getting to the saint's body. How? rejoined Marchese. I will tell you, replied Martellino. I will counterfeit a paralytic 
and thou wilt support me on one side, and Stecky on the other, as if I were not able to go alone, and so you will enter the church, making it appear as if you were leading me up to the body of the saint, that he may heal me, and all that see will make way and give us free passage. Marchese and Stecchi approved the plan, so all three forthwith left the inn and repaired to a lonely place where Martellino distorted his hands, his fingers, his arms, his legs, and also his mouth and eyes and his entire face in a manner horrible to contemplate, so that no stranger that saw him could have doubted that he was impotent and paralyzed in every part of his body. In this guise, Marchese and Stecchi laid hold of him and led him towards the church, assuming a most piteous air, and humbly beseeching everybody for God's sake to make way for them. Their request was readily granted, and in short, observed by all and crying out at almost every step, Make way, make way, they reached the place where St. Arrigo's body was laid. Whereupon some gentlemen who stood by hoisted Martellino onto the saint's body, that thereby he might receive the boon of health. There he lay still for a while, the eyes of all in the church being riveted upon him in expectation of the result. Then, being a very practised performer, he stretched first one of his fingers, next a hand, afterwards an arm, and so forth making as if he gradually recovered the use of all his natural powers, which the people observing raised such a clamour in honour of St. Arrigo that even thunder would have been inaudible. Now it chanced that hard by stood a Florentine who knew Martellino well, though he had failed to recognise him when in such strange guise he was led into the church. But now, seeing him resume his natural shape, the Florentine recognized him, and at once said with a laugh, God's curse upon him! Who that saw him come but would have believed that he was really paralyzed? These words were overheard by some of the Trevisans, who began forthwith to question the Florentine. How? said they. Was he then not paralyzed? No, by God, returned the Florentine. He has always been as straight as any of us. He has merely shown you that he knows better than any man alive how to play this trick of putting on any counterfeit semblance that he chooses. Thereupon the Trevisans, without further parley, made a rush, clearing the way and crying out as they went, Seize this traitor who mocks at God and his saints who, being no paralytic, has come hither in the guise of a paralytic, to deride our patron saint and us. So saying, they laid hands on him, dragged him down from where he stood, seized him by the hair, tore the clothes from his back, and fell to beating and kicking him, so that it seemed to him as if all the world were upon him. He cried out, Pity, for God's sake! and defended himself as best he could. All in vain, however. The press became thicker and thicker, moment by moment. Which, Stecchi and Marchese observing, began to say one to the other that twas a bad business. Yet, being apprehensive on their own account, they did not venture to come to his assistance, but cried out with the rest that he ought to die. At the same time, however, casting about how they might find the means to rescue him from the hands of the people, who would certainly have killed him, but for a diversion which Marchese hastily effected. The entire posse of the signory being just outside, he ran off at full speed to the Podesta's lieutenant, and said to him, Help, for God's sake! There is a villain here that has cut my purse with full a hundred florins of gold in it. Prithee have him arrested, that I may have my own again. Whereupon twelve sergeants or more ran forthwith to the place where the hapless Martellino was being carded without a comb, and forcing their way with the utmost difficulty through the throng, 
rescued him all bruised and battered from their hands, and led him to the palace, whither he was followed by many who, resenting what he had done, and hearing that he was arrested as a cut-purse, and lacking better pretext for harassing him, began one and all to charge him with having cut their purses. All which the deputy of the Podesta had no sooner heard than, being a harsh man, he straightway took Martellino aside and began to examine him. Martellino answered his questions in a bantering tone, making light of the arrest, whereat the deputy, losing patience, had him bound to the strapado and caused him to receive a few hints of the cord with intent to extort from him a confession of his guilt by way of preliminary to hanging him. Taken down from the strapado, and questioned by the deputy if what his accusers said were true, Martellino, as nothing was to be gained by denial, answered, My lord, I am ready to confess the truth. Let but my accusers say, each of them, when and where I cut his purse, and I will tell you what I have and what I have not done. So be it, said the deputy and caused a few of them to be summoned. Whereupon Martellino, being charged with having cut this, that, or the other man's purse eight, six, or four days ago, while others averred that he had cut their purses that very day, answered thus, My lord, these men lie in the throat, and for token that I speak true, I tell you that, so far from having been here as long as they make out, it is but very lately that I came into these parts, where I never was before. And no sooner was I come than, as my ill luck would have it, I went to see the body of this saint, and so have been carded as you see. And that what I say is true, his lordship's intendant of arrivals, and his book, and also my host, may certify. Wherefore, if you find that even so it is as I say, hearken not to these wicked men, and spare me the torture and death which they would have you inflict. In this posture of affairs, Marchese and Stecchi, learning that the Podesta's deputy was dealing rigorously with Martellino, and had already put him to the strapado, grew mightily alarmed. We have made a mess of it, they said to themselves, we have only taken him out of the frying pan to toss him into the fire. So, hurrying hither and thither with the utmost zeal, they made diligent search until they found their host, and told him how matters stood. The host had his laugh over the affair, and then brought them to one Sandro Agalanti, who dwelt in Treviso, and had great interest with the lord of the place. The host laid the whole matter before Sandro, and, backed by Marchese and Stecchi, besought him to undertake Martellino's cause. Sandro, after many a hearty laugh, hied him to the lord, who at his instance sent for Martellino. The messengers found Martellino still in his shirt before the deputy, at his wit's end, and all but beside himself with fear because the deputy would hear nothing that he said in his defence. Indeed, the deputy, having a spite against Florentines, had quite made up his mind to have him hanged. He was therefore in the last degree reluctant to surrender him to the Lord, and only did so upon compulsion. Brought at length before the Lord, Martellino detailed to him the whole affair and prayed him as the greatest of favours to let him depart in peace. The Lord had a hearty laugh over the adventure, and bestowed a tunic on each of the three. So, congratulating themselves on their unexpected deliverance from so great a peril, they returned home safe and sound. End of Day 2 The First Story Recording by Ruth Golding Day 2, the second story, of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please see the Library of Congress. Thank you. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day Two The Second Story Rinaldo d'Asti is robbed, arrives at Castel Guglielmo, and is entertained by a Widow Lady. His Property is restored to him, and he returns safe and sound. The ladies and the young men, especially Filostrato, laughed inordinately at Ney Phillo's narrative of Martellino's misadventures. Then Filostrato, who sate next Ney Phillo, received the Queen's command to follow her, and promptly thus began: "Fair ladies, 'tis on my mind to tell you a story, in which are mingled things sacred and passages of adverse fortune and love, which to hear will perchance be not unprofitable, more especially to travellers in love's treacherous lands, of whom if any fail to say St. Julian's Paternoster, it often happens that, though he may have a good bed, he is ill lodged. Know, then, that in the time of the Marquis Azzo di Ferrara, a merchant, Rinaldo d'Asti by name, having disposed of certain affairs which had brought him to Bologna, set his face homeward, and, having left Ferrara behind him, was on his way to Verona, when he fell in with some men that looked like merchants, but were in truth robbers and men of evil life and condition, whose company he imprudently joined, riding and conversing with them. They, perceiving that he was a merchant, and judging that he must have money about him, complotted to rob him on the first opportunity, and to obviate suspicion they played the part of worthy and reputable men, their discourse of naught but what was seemly and honourable and leal, their demeanour at once as respectful and cordial as they could make it, so that he deemed himself very lucky to have met them, being otherwise alone save for the single mounted servant. Journeying thus, they conversed, after the desultory manner of travellers, of diverse matters, till at last they fell a-talking of the prayers which men address to God, and one of the robbers, there were three of them, said to Rinaldo, And you, gentle sir, what is your wanted orison when you are on your travels? Rinaldo answered, Why, to tell the truth, I am a man unskilled, unlearned in such manners, and few prayers have I at my command, being one that lives in the good old way, and lets two soldi count for twenty-four deniers. Nevertheless, it has always been my custom, in journeying, to say of a morning, as I leave the inn, a paternoster and an Ave Maria for the souls of the father and mother of St. Julian, after which I pray God and St. Julian to provide me with a good inn for the night. And many a time in the course of my life I have met with great perils by the way, and evading them all have found comfortable quarters for the night, whereby my faith is assured that St. Julian, in whose honor I say my paternoster, has gotten me this favor of God, nor should I look for a prosperous journey and a safe arrival by night, if I had not said it in the morning. Then said his interrogator, And did you say it this morning? Whereto Rinaldo answered, Troth did I, which caused the other, who by this time knew by what course matters would take, to say to himself, Twill prove to have been said at a nick of time, for if we do not miscarry, I take it, thou wilt have but a sorry lodging. Then, turning to Rinaldo, he said, I also have travelled much, and never a prayer have I said, though I have heard them much commended by many, nor has it ever been my lot to find other than good quarters for the night. It may be that this very evening you will be able to determine which of us has the better lodging, you that have said the paternoster, or I that have not said it. True, however, that in its stead I am accustomed to say, De repusti, or intermorata, or the de profundis, which, if what my grandmother used to say is to be believed, are of the greatest efficacy. So, talking of diverse matters, and ever on the lookout for time and place suited to their evil purpose, they continued their journey, till towards evening, some distance from Castel Guglielmo, as they were about to ford a stream, these three ruffians, profiting by the lateness of the hour, in the loneliness and straightness of the place, set upon Rinaldo and robbed him, and leaving him afoot and in his shirt, said by way of adieu, Go now, and see if thy Saint Julian will provide thee with good lodging tonight. Our Saint, we doubt not, 
will do as much by us." And so, crossing the stream, they went their way. Rinaldo's servant, coward though he was, did nothing to help his master when he saw him attacked, but turned his horse's head and was off at a smart pace, nor did he draw rein till he was come to Castel Guglielmo, which, it now being evening, he put up at an inn and gave himself no further trouble. Rinaldo, left barefoot and stripped to his shirt, when the night closed in, very cold and snowy, was at his wits' end, and shivering so that his teeth chattered in his head, began to peer about, if haply he might find some shelter for the night, that so he might not perish with the cold; but seeing none, for during a recent war the whole country had been wasted by fire, he set off for Castel Guglielmo, quickening his pace by reason of the cold. Whether his servant had taken refuge in Castel Guglielmo or elsewhere he knew not, but he thought that, could he but enter the town, God would surely send him some succor. However, dark night overtook him while he was still about a mile from the castle, so that on his arrival he found the gates already locked and the bridges raised, and he could not pass in. Sick at heart, disconsolate, and bewailing his evil fortune, he looked about for some place where he might ensconce himself, and at any rate find shelter from the snow. By good luck he espied a house, built with a balcony a little above the castle wall, under which balcony he proposed to shelter himself until daybreak. Arrived at the spot, he found beneath the balcony a postern, which, however, was locked, and, having gathered some bits of straw that lay about, he placed them in front of the postern, and there, in sad and sorrowful plight, took up his quarters, with many a piteous appeal to St. Julian, whom he reproached for not better rewarding the faith which he reposed in him. St. Julian, however, had not abandoned him, and in due time provided him with a good lodging. There was, in the castle, a widow lady of extraordinary beauty, none fairer, whom Marquis Azzo loved as his own life, and kept there for his pleasure. She lived in that very same house beneath the balcony of which Rinaldo had posted himself. Now it chanced that that very day the Marquis had come to Castel Guglielmo to pass the night with her, and had privily caused a bath to be made ready, and a supper suited to his rank in the lady's own house. The arrangements were complete, and only the Marquis was stayed for when a servant happened to present himself at the castle gate, bringing tidings for the Marquis, which obliged him suddenly to take horse. He therefore sent word to the lady that she must not wait for him. The lady, somewhat disconsolate, found nothing better to do than to get into the bath which had been intended for the Marquis, sup, and go to bed. So into the bath she went. The bath was close to the postern on the other side, of which hapless Rinaldo had ensconced himself and thus the mournful and quavering music which Rinaldo made as he shuddered in the cold, and which seemed rather to proceed from a stork's beak than from the mouth of a human being, was audible to the lady in the bath. She therefore called her maid and said to her, Go up and look out over the wall and down the postern and mark who is there, and what he is, and what he does there. The maid obeyed, and the knight, being fine, had no difficulty in making out Rinaldo as he sat there barefoot, as I have said, and in his shirt, trembling in every limb. So she called out to him, to know who he was. Renato, who could scarcely articulate for shivering, told as briefly as he could who he was, and how and why he had come there, which done, he began piteously to beseech her not, if she could avoid it, to leave him there all night to perish of cold. The maid went back to her mistress, full of pity for Renato, and told her all that she had seen and heard. The lady felt no less pity for Rinaldo, and bethinking her that she had the key of the postern by which the Marquis sometimes entered when he paid her a secret visit, she said to the maid, Go, and let him in softly. Here is this supper, and there will be none to eat it. We can very well put him up for the night. Cordially commending her mistress's humanity, the maid went and let Rinaldo in, and brought him to the lady, who, seeing he was all but dead with cold, said to him, Quick, good man! Get into that bath, which is still warm. Gladly he did so, awaiting no second invitation, and was so much comforted by its warmth that he seemed to have passed from death to life. The lady provided him with a suit of clothes which had been worn by her husband shortly before his death, and which, when he had had them on, 
looked as if they had been made for him. So he recovered heart, and while he awaited the lady's commands, gave thanks to God and St. Julian for delivering him from a woeful night and conducting him, as it seemed, to comfortable quarters. The lady meanwhile took a little rest, after which she had a roaring fire put in one of her large rooms, whither presently she came, and asked her maid how the good man did. The maid replied, "Madam, he has put on the clothes in which he shews to advantage, having a handsome person and seeming to be a worthy man and well bred." "Go, call him then," said the lady, "tell him to come hither to the fire, and we will sup, for I know that he has not supped." Rinaldo, on entering the room and seeing the lady, took her to be of no small consequence; he therefore made a low bow, and did his utmost to thank her worthily for the service she had rendered him. His words pleased her no less than his person, which accorded with what the maid had said, so she made him heartily welcome, installed him at his ease by her side before the fire, and questioned him of the adventure which had brought him thither. Rinaldo detailed all the circumstances, of which the lady had heard somewhat when Rinaldo's servant made his appearance at the castle. She therefore gave entire credence to what he said, told him what she knew about his servant, and how he might easily find him on the morrow. She then bade set the table, which done, Rinaldo and she washed their hands and sate together to sup. Tall he was, and comely of form and feature, debonair and gracious of mien and manner, and in his lusty prime. The lady had eyed him again and again to her no small satisfaction, and, her wantonness being already kindled for the marquis, who was to have come to lie with her, she had let Rinaldo take the vacant place in her mind. So, when supper was done and they were arisen from the table, she conferred with her maid, after the cruel trick played upon her by the marquis, if it were not well to take a good gift which fortune had sent her. The maid, knowing the bent of her mistress's desire, left no word unsaid that might encourage her to follow it. Wherefore the lady, turning towards Rinaldo, who was standing where she had left him by the fire, began thus, So, Rinaldo, why still so pensive? Will nothing console you for the loss of a horse and a few clothes? Take heart, put a blithe face on. You are at home. Nay, more, let me tell you that, seeing you in those clothes which my late husband used to wear, and taking you for him, I have felt that, not once or twice, but perhaps a hundred times this evening, a longing to throw my arms round you and kiss you, and, in faith, I had so done, but that I feared it might displease you. Rinaldo, hearing these words, and marking the flame which shot from the lady's eyes, and being no laggard, came forward with open arms, and confronted her, and said, Madam, I am not unmindful that I must ever acknowledge that to you I owe my life in regard of the peril whence you rescued me. If, then, there be any way in which I may pleasure you, churlish indeed, were I not to devise it. So you may even embrace and kiss me to your heart's content, and I will embrace and kiss you with the best of good wills. There needed no further parley. The lady, all aflame with amorous desire, forthwith threw herself into his arms, and straining him to her bosom with a thousand passionate embraces, gave and received a thousand kisses before they sought her chamber. There, with all speed, they went to bed, nor did day surprise them, until again, and again, and, in full measure, they had satisfied their desire. With the first streaks of dawn they rose, for the lady was minded that none should surmise aught of the affair. So, having meanly habited Rinaldo, and replenished his purse, she enjoined him to keep the secret, showed him the way to the castle, where he might find his servant, and let him out by the same postern by which he had entered. When it was broad day, the gates were opened, and Rinaldo, passing himself off as a traveller from distant parts, entered the castle, and found his servant. Having put on the spare suit which was in his valise, he was about to mount the servant's horse, when, as if by a miracle, there were brought into the castle the three gentlemen of the road, who had robbed him the evening before, having been taken a little while after for another offence. Upon their confession, Rinaldo's horse was restored to him, as were also his clothes and money, so that he lost nothing except a pair of garters, of which the robbers knew not where they had bestowed them. 
Wherefore Rinaldo, giving thanks to God and St. Julian, mounted his horse, and returned home safe and sound, and on the morrow the three robbers kicked heels in the wind. DAY TWO THE THIRD STORY OF THE DECAMERON This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tonight's recording by Miette. THE DECAMERON by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day two, the third story. Three young men squander their substance and are reduced to poverty. Their nephew, returning home a desperate man, falls in with an abbot in whom he discovers the daughter of the King of England. She marries him, and he retrieves the losses, and re-establishes the fortunes of his uncles. The ladies marveled to hear the adventures of Rinaldo Asti, praised his devotion, and gave thanks to God and St. Julian for the succor lent him in his extreme need. No, though the verdict was hardly outspoken, was the lady deemed unwise to take the boon which God has sent her. So they tittered and talked of her night of delight, while Pompinea, being seated by Philostrato, and surmising that her turn would, as it did, come next, was lost in meditation on what she was to say. Roused from her reverie by the word of the queen, she put on a cheerful courage, and thus began. Noble ladies, discourse as we may of fortune's handiwork, much still remains to be said, if we but scan events aright. Nor need we marvel thereat, if we but duly consider that all matters, which we foolishly call our own, are in her hands, and therefore subject at her inscrutable will to every variety of chance and change without any order therein by us, discernible, which is indeed signally manifest everywhere and all day long, yet, as tis our queen's will that we speak thereof, perhaps twill not be unprofitable to you if, notwithstanding, it has been the theme of some of the foregoing stories. I add to them another, which I believe should give you pleasure. There was formerly in our city a knight, by name Messer Tedaldo, of the Lamberti, according to some, or, as others say, of the Agolanti family, perhaps for no other better reason than that the occupation of his sons was similar to that which always was, and is the occupation of the Agolanti. However, without professing to determine which of the two houses he belonged to, I say that he was in his day a very wealthy knight, and had three sons, the eldest being by name Lamberto, the second Tedaldo, and the third Agolante. Fine, spirited young men were they all, Though the eldest was not yet eighteen years old when their father, Messer Tadaldo, died very rich, leaving to them as his lawful heirs the whole of his property, both movable and immovable. Finding themselves thus possessed of great wealth, both in money and in lands and chattels, they fell to spending without stint or restraint, indulging their every desire, maintaining a great establishment, and a large and well-filled stable, 
Besides dogs and hawks, keeping their open house, scattering largesses, jousting, and not content with these and the like pastimes proper to their condition, indulging every appetite natural to their youth. They had not long followed this course of life before the cash left them by their father was exhausted, and their rents not sufficing to defray their expenditure, they began to sell and pledge their property, and disposing of it by degrees, one item today and another tomorrow, they hardly perceived that they were approaching the verge of ruin, until poverty opened the eyes which wealth had fast sealed. So, one day, Lamberto called his brothers to him, reminded them of the position of wealth and dignity which had been theirs and their fathers before them, and shewed them the poverty to which their extravagance had reduced them, and adjured them most earnestly that, before their destitution was yet further manifest, they should all three sell what little remained to them and depart thence, which, accordingly, they did. Without leave-taking or any ceremony, they quitted Florence. Nor did they rest until they had arrived in England and established themselves in a small house in London, where, by living with extreme parsimony and lending at exorbitant usances, they prospered so well that in the course of a few years they amassed a fortune. And so, one by one, they returned to Florence, purchased not a few of their former estates besides many others, and married. The management of their affairs in England, where they continued their business as usurers, they left to a young nephew, Alessandro by name, while heedless of like of the teaching of experience and of marital and parental duty, they all three launched out at Florence into more extravagant expenditure than before, and contracted debts on all hands and to large amounts. This expenditure they were enabled for some years to support by the remittances made by Alessandro, who, to his great profit, had lent money to the barons of the security of their castles and rents. While the three brothers thus continued to spend freely, and when short of money to borrow it, never doubting of help from England, it so happened that, to the surprise of everybody, there broke out in England a war between the king and his son, by which the whole island was divided into two camps, whereby Alessandro lost all his mortgages of the baronial castles and every other source of income whatsoever. However, in the daily expectation that peace would be concluded between the king and his son, Alessandro, hoping that, in that event all would be restored to him, principal and interest tarried in the island, and the three brothers at Florence in no degree retrenched their extravagant expenditure, but went on borrowing from day to day. Several years thus passed, and, their hopes being frustrated, the three brothers not only lost credit, but, being pressed for payment by their creditors, were suddenly arrested and their property proving deficient, were kept in prison for the balance while their wives and little children went into the country parts, or elsewhere, wretchedly equipped, and with no other prospect than to pass the rest of their days in destitution. Alessandro, meanwhile, seeing that the peace which he had for several years awaited in England, did not come, and deeming that he would hazard his life to no purpose by tarrying longer in the country, made up his mind 
to return to Italy. He traveled at first all together alone, but it so chanced that he left Bruges at the same time with an abbot. Habited in white, attended by a numerous retinue and preceded by a goodly baggage train. Behind the abbot rode two grey-beard knights, kinsmen of the king, in whom Alessandro recognized acquaintances, and, making himself known to them, was readily received into their company. As thus they journeyed together, Alessandro softly asked them who the monks were that rode in front with so great a train, and whither they were bound. The foremost rider, replied one of the knights, is a young kinsman of ours, the newly elected abbot of one of the greatest abbeys of England, and as he is not of legal age for such a dignity, we are going with him to Rome to obtain the Holy Father's dispensation and his confirmation in the office. But this is not a matter for common talk. Now, the new abbot as lords are wont to do when they travel, was sometimes in front, sometimes in rear of his train. And thus it happened that, as he passed, he set eyes on Alessandro, who was still quite young, and very shapely and well favoured, and as courteous, gracious, and debonair as e'er another. The abbot was marvellously taken with him at first sight, having never seen aught that pleased him so much, called him to his side, addressed him graciously, and asked who he was, whence he came, and whither he was bound. Alessandro frankly told all about himself, and having thus answered the abbot's questions, placed himself at his service as far as his small ability might extend. The abbot was struck by his easy flow of apt speech, and observing his bearing more closely, he made up his mind that, albeit his occupation was base, he was nevertheless of gentle blood, which added no little to his interest in him, and being moved to compassion by his misfortunes, he gave him friendly consolation, bidding him be of good hope that if he lived a worthy life, God would yet see him in a place no less or even more exalted than when fortune had cast him down, and prayed him to be of his company as far as Tuscany, as both were going the same way. Alessandro thanked him for his words of comfort, and professed himself ready to obey his every command. So fared on the abbot, his mind full of new ideas begotten by the sight of Alessandro, until some days later they came to a town which was none too well provided with inns, and as the abbot must needs put up there, Alessandro, who was well acquainted with one of the innkeepers, arranged that the abbot should alight at his house, and procured him the least discomfortable quarters which it could afford. He thus became, for the nonce, the abbot's sensual, and, being very expert for such office, managed excellently, quartering the retinue in diverse parts of the town. So the abbot sucked, and, a night being far spent, all went to bed, except Alessandro, who then asked the host where he might find quarters for the night. In good sooth I know not, replied the host, thou seest that every place is occupied, and that I and my household must lie on the benches. However, in the abbot's chamber there are some corn sacks. I can shew thee the way thither, and lay a bit of bed upon them, and there, and it like thee, thou mayst pass the night very well. 
How sayst thou, asked Alessandro, in the abbot's chamber, which thou knowest is small, and that there was not room for any of the monks to sleep there? Had I understood this when the curtains were drawn, I would have quartered his monks on the corn sacks and slept myself where the monks sleep. "'Tis even so, however, replied the host, and thou canst, if thou wilt, find excellent quarters there. The abbot sleeps, the curtains are close drawn. I will go in softly and lay a small bed there on which thou canst sleep. Alessandro, satisfied that it might be managed without disturbing the abbot, accepted the offer and made his arrangements for passing the night as quietly as he could. The abbot was not asleep, his mind being far too overwrought by certain newly awakened desires. He had heard what had passed between Alessandro and the host. He had marked the place where Alessandro had lain down, and in the great gladness of his heart, he had begun thus to commune with himself. God has sent me the opportunity of gratifying my desire. If I let it pass, Perchance it will be long before another such opportunity occurs. So, being minded by no means to let it slip, when all was quiet in the end, he softly called Alessandro and bade him lie down by his side. Alessandro made many excuses, but ended by undressing and obeying. Whereupon the abbot laid a hand on Alessandro's breast and began to caress him just as amorous girls do their lovers, whereat Alessandro marvelled greatly, doubting the abbot was prompted to such caresses by a shameful love, which the abbot speedily divined or else surmised from some movement on Alessandro's part.